guys, welcome. My name is Daphne. I hope you all are having an incredible day. So today, I wanted to go into a deep dive about an incident that happened with the show. Actually, it was the show's very first magazine cover ever. An incredible first season it was actually a smash hit, like iconic right off the bat. The show is Desperate Housewives. Desperate Housewives is a wild ride, I'll tell you that. The first season is so well written and personally one of my favorite first seasons of any TV show. The drama, the mystery, and the one-liners, like everything about the show, the comedy, oh my gosh, it's just is a top tier first season for sure. Things that just scrolling through, just kind of looking stuff up about it was the Vanity Fair cover that almost didn't happen. I want to find out more kind of about this, in my opinion, very iconic pop culture event. Come on, grab your snacks, grab your drinks, whatever. I am drinking, oh, I spilled it, a really full glass of water. I got this really big lemon slice with scissors, so don't ask, but cheers. <laughs> Rolling through, just kind of looking stuff up about it, was the Vanity Fair cover that almost didn't happen. And even in the Vanity Fair cover, the title, it says, you wouldn't believe what it would take just to get this photo. Which is insane to think about over just one photo shoot, but this photo shoot actually inspired an entire Saturday Night Live skit as well. That ha photo shoot happened in April, and I think the SNL skit happened in November. So over a year. <laughs> so it was over a year. Almost a whole year. Everyone wanted to know what happened, especially after the cover came out. It just fueled the fire even more. Some of the stars were being asked about it. And I actually have a lot of quotes from the stars um, of the TV show and also the men who are on the show who were there on set as well had a lot of things to say about it. Before we get into that fateful day, I think we should look back a little bit at kind of why the stakes were so high for this show, kind of the tensions that were going into it, a little bit about our leading ladies, our desperate housewives. So yeah, the so workplace drama is always inevitable, kind of wherever you work, whether you work at a hospital or in retail or literally one of the biggest shows on the planet at the time, there's always bound to be at least like a disagreement or two. And kind of being too young then when the show first came out and aired to kind of really understand, it was really exciting to rewatch it and see kind of how it holds up today. And really well, not gonna lie. I mean, some parts are obviously very early 2000s and there's quite a commitment to rewatch I mean, 180 hour long episodes, but is definitely worth it <laughs> at least the first season at least watch the first season so after falling deeper and deeper down into the rabbit hole that is this for housewives and kind of having an well not actually having a connection to where it was filmed i used to work at universal studios myself and if you don't know desperate housewives is filmed on the back lot and you can still visit the sets to today it's called colonial street and visit universal you can take the studio tour which is a, is a ride but you actually get to go all down the sets of some really iconic places kind of to get it a little bit deeper about the show kind of what it's about if you've never watched it before it introduces our four central characters Susan Meyer, Lynette Scavo, Brie Van de Camp, and Gabrielle Solis. The first season premiered on October 3rd, 2004. Yeah, ask me what day it was. <laughs> and introduced the four essential characters of the show. The main mystery of the season is the unexpected unaliving of their dear friend and neighbor, Mary Alice Young, and kind of the events and how it affects the housewives and the mystery of kind of why she did it. The first season with Lynette struggling to cope with her four demanding children, Bree's fighting to save her marriage with Rex, while dealing with her very rebellious son, <laughs> and Gabrielle tries to prevent her husband Carlos from discovering that she's having an affair with their teenage gardener. So that part really does not age well. Legit teenage in high school. Yeah. <laughs> and we have Susan, who's fighting with Edie Brand for the fashion of a hot new mysterious neighbor, Mike Delvino. And all of this is being narrated by Mary Alice Young, the housewife who unalived herself and is the main thread of the first season, the mysterious reasons of why. It aired for eight seasons. It started October 3rd, 2004 until May 13th, 2012. And it's still the longest running TV show with an all-female lead cast. It actually just surpassed Charm. The writer and creator, Mark Cherry, envisioned a series that would kind of blend legitimate sense of humor with comedy and drama. Um, he wanted to create a look behind the seemingly ordinary housewives with problems that screen people that we all can relate and kind of identify with. Each housewife, would, each housewife would have their own backing of fans as well as we all would collectively kind of love them all together as well. Which, 
definitely happens. Furthermore, he created Wisteria Lane as a wholesome neighborhood that seems friendly and picture perfect, yet hiding very dark secrets. The show had a huge impact when it first came out. First Lady Laura Bush at the time, wife of President George W. Bush, heard that she's a desperate housewife. She would watch it anytime George fell asleep. <laughs> Hi, editing me here. Um, so I found the clip of Laura Bush uh, saying that she is a desperate housewife. It was actually at a White House Correspondence Dinner in 2005, and the clip is really shady towards George Bush, and it's actually really funny. And um, so I'm just going to put the whole clip in here for you as well, and enjoy my curlers. Enjoy. <laughs> I am married to the President of the United States, and here's our typical evening. <laughs> Nine o'clock. Mr. Excitement here is sound asleep. And I'm watching Desperate Housewives. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I am a Desperate Housewife. <laughs> I mean, if those women on that show think they're desperate, they ought to be with George. <laughs> And also, Oprah Winfrey was a huge fan of the show, and she actually filmed an episode of her show on set as well, so it was pretty cool. And during the run of the first season, the show had become one of the most probable to win awards, and it did. It won many for the cast and crew, and actually the following year in 2006, Bravo's reality show, The Real Housewives of Franchise, started in response of how popular Desperate Housewives was. So, and with the insane amount of pressure with the series to back up season one, they were very, very nervous that they were going to reach something called a sophomore slump of the second season. The ladies were first earning 80000 per episode and now thinking in terms of 250000 per episode. Quite a huge jump. A little bit of background into each housewife and kind of where they were at at the time of their career and kind of a backstory on their casting. So first we have Lynette Scavo, who's played by Felicity Huffman. She's married to celebrated actor William H. Macy, known in Fargo and Boogie Nights. She actually arrived on Desperate Housewives with the most chops, having frequently worked with a playwright whom her husband co-founded at the famed Atlantic Theatre Company in New York. Mike Cherry said that she was an easy call for the role, so she's basically just a shoo-in. Ready to go. Gabrielle Solis was played by Eva Longoria, and actually her story is kind of my favorite of how she got the role. She's quoted saying, I'm in a very different position than the other girls, Longoria says. I've never had a successful show, so for me everything is new, and it's nice to be the new kid on the block, she says, with seasoned women taking her under her wing, under, under their wings. <laughs> And she said it all comes in a very big sister way. She said she's pretty lucky in that sense. And there may be more pressure for them as their comeback from their has-been days. She said she has nothing to prove yet, so not wrong. Longoria simply longoria her way into character, as quoted. <laughs> as her fourth audition of the day for a pilot season, she recalls, and she's like, okay, what is this show about? And Mark Cherry asked what she thought of the script, and she only read her part. Mark Cherry replied, very Gabrielle. So she very much embodied the role, which I think is very cool. Brie Vandekamp, played by Marsha Cross, was also a pretty much a shoon as well. In the mid-90s, she co-starred on Melrose Place, and Mark Cherry said that Cross was an easy pick, quote, saying, who does uptight better than anyone he knows? We have Susan Meyer, who's played by Terry Hatcher. She was best known for her mid-90s TV series, Lois and Clark. The Adventures of Superman, a Bond girl in 1997's Tomorrow Never Dies, and she also guest starred on Seinfeld. So, very cool indeed. Last but very much not least, we have Edie Britt, played by Nicola Sheridan, a less obvious choice. She used to be on Knott's Landing, which I've never seen, but actually researching this has inspired me to add it to a list to watch. And Sheridan wanted to actually play Brie which is interesting. <laughs> um, Mark Cherry said that she actually had the worst audition ever, and he was just sitting there horrified, asking why she's wearing such a low-cut outfit. Then Cherry asked if Nicolette Sheridan if she didn't mind reading for the smaller role of Edie Britt, the neighborhood skank. Nicolette Sheridan recalls saying, great, I come in dressed for mother of two, <laughs> and I leave the slut. So a little bit before set, Mark Cherry's quoted saying, we should have known that night on the Universal Backlot where Mark Cherry, the creator, the mastermind of Desperate Housewives, 
was fretting. I hope everything works out. He said, the Vanity Fair shoot is this weekend. I think it's a problem on our end. Coordinating all the... His voice trailed off. Yeah, he said softly, as if to himself. I'm sure it'll be fine. So for some reason, there was just a lot of tension already, even a few days before. Everyone was just really nervous about this. A lot of high stakes, I guess. The location is actually not too far from Universal. It's only a mile and a half away at the Bing Crosby Estate in Toluca Lake. At ABC's request, the schedule would be really tight, actually extremely tight, beginning at 9 a.m. and ending at 4 p.m. Typically, cover sheets take about two days to complete, so this is pretty insane that they want to get all this done, getting a cover shoot and then five individual shoots of the actors. So minus time for essentials like wardrobe and stylus and coffee runs, of course, that left about 60 minutes for the group shot and 30 minutes for each star's single shot. That's insane. With lights and setup and positioning, that's seems like they're kind of almost setting themselves up. On top of all of that, there was a lot of publicists on set. ABC said that there wouldn't be, but of course there were ABC publicists. But then there was also touchstone publicists, personal publicists, and assistants to the publicists. So this caused even more drama. It just keeps building and building and building. So in the Vanity Fair article, um, the writer, Ned, calls a certain assistant, um, actually a publicity shoot coordinator, the enabler, is used a lot, a lot, a lot through this. So please do not take a shot every time I say the word the enabler. If you do, then just please take it of water and stay hydrated. <laughs> And then there was Enabler. Employed by ABC as some sort of publicity shoot coordinator, the Enabler worked for no man. He worked for the ladies, which we love that. I mean, he should work for the ladies. <laughs> if the ladies were displeased, then the Enabler was displeased. And if the Enabler was displeased, then it was hell, end quote. It be easy to have um, people from ABC who, you know, uh, realistically were s representing all of us not really be behaving that way. So the enabler had come arrived armed with ABC's list of demands, including wardrobe requirements, specifically no bathing suits. <laughs> Remember that, that is very important. Specifically, no bathing suits. They're also really, really particular about positioning that Terry Hatcher actually could not be in the group center of any group photo, that she was strictly not to be in the center. Anyone else, the other four ladies, but Terry Hatcher. And then also, and actually this quoted, whatever you do, he instructed the photo crew, do not let Terry go into wardrobe first. So extremely heavy foreshadowing. <laughs> no bathing suits and do not let Terry Hatcher go into wardrobe first. Evidently there was some somebody in the cast or at ABC was concerned that Terry Hatcher always got there first and got the best clothes. Which I mean can't really fault her for that. I mean, if, especially going to be on Vanity Fair, I mean, I would want the best clothes also. This shoot, it was kind of a first come, first serve basis, which I guess is a standard Hollywood protocol. I didn't know that. I kind of figured that they would have planned outfits for each individual person, but I guess for this shoot or the protocol back then, I'm not sure if it's still protocol now. If it is, let me know. That would be new to me. I never heard that before I read that article. So um, I actually read the thing and I went, really? I'm not allowed in the wardrobe trailer before anybody else? But you know, then I guess they have the, this enablers behavior. So uh, apparently, I mean, it must kind of be true. So the morning of, the morning was very bright and promising, actually. Eva Longoria actually <laughs> was. She arrived two hours early. <laughs> at 7 a.m. thanks to miscommunication by her publicist. So even with all these sounds like so many publicists and there's still miscommunication. And actually she was also scheduled for the very last final single shot of the day as well. So finding herself virtually alone she headed to the house determined to sleep a couple hours away in peace to just chill in which love that for her. <laughs> it's a gorgeous house so I'm sure she had plenty of rooms to choose from to take a nap. Well about an hour and 15 minutes later Terry Hatcher arrived. She was the first lady to arrive to wardrobe. So Eva Longoria is probably upstairs taking a nap. She didn't even know that probably Terry Hatcher was even there. So at 8.15 Terry Hatcher cheerfully made her way into the trailer. Color yells you've got to stop her she can't go in there first which she did. And even worse, the enabler discovered that Terry Hatcher had consulted with a shoot stylist a couple days before, 
which is actually totally routine and she just was probably just finding out like what was up because it's a big photo shoot and their first photo shoot like their first cover like magazine cover i should not like their first like photo shoot i probably should keep like referencing that it's their first magazine cover together cute and so it's totally routine but the enabler interpreted it as something very dark that she was being like malicious talking to the wardrobe person the rest of the ladies arrived and were getting ready things seemed to go fine and then suddenly the enabler complained and said this is a problem i'm getting text messages from eva everything is not fine so i wonder if maybe it just wasn't fine because she was taking a nap and no one woke her up so she could go to wardrobe first or if she really knows but the women were invited to pick from a large selection of 1950s pinup style clothing and all but felicity huffman ended up in bathing suits abc said no bathing suits and what are they dressed in bathing suits so of course the enabler was furious absolutely furious. <laughs> Apparently the network was worried that people were calling the series trashy and wanted to maintain a high tone for the photos. But the ladies, which is very interesting <laughs> because I, hmm, I wonder where they got the idea that this was trashy. It's not like they had this promotion out that would have given anyone that interpretation. Hmm. So anyways, <laughs> Apparently the network was worried that people were calling the series trashy and wanted to maintain a high tone for the photos, but the ladies didn't seem to care, which was understandable given that they're about to be photographed lounging poolside. They probably gravitated towards the swimsuit. It didn't really seem like there was a huge direction of what this photo was supposed to be besides just 50s. So seeing the gorgeous pool that they're photographed in front of, like, of course. Uh, the enabler, of course, accused Vanity Fair, in essence, of the swimsuit violations. <laughs> He could barely control his rage. <laughs> I love that that's in the article. He could barely control his rage. <laughs> Meanwhile, the ladies were sauntering around in their bathing suits, basking in a torrent of compliments by their publicists, which I love for them. They all looked incredible. I'm like, oh, absolutely gorgeous. The photos are beautiful. Oh my gosh. I love each of their single shots, the full shot. There's a lot of contention about, of course, Terry Hatcher being in the middle of the photo shoot. She shouldn't be in the middle of any promo or photo shoot. This was her big comeback and that she was the lead of the show. Which is interesting because I would say, kind of rewatching it, that Brie Vandekamp is kind of, if there is a lead, it's kind of her. Like, she has the line, the biggest character development. If you agree, let me know. It's kind of interesting now that you think about it. <laughs> Anyways, off topic. Back to it. So, Terry Hatcher thought that this was her main comeback. She was known to putting herself kind of, I guess, in the center of things. Wearing their chosen attire, the ladies come in near what used to be Bing Crosby's pool, smiling, exchanging in small talk, and all their publicists were clustered off the set. <laughs> they were put around the corner <laughs> and they all were talking, and I guess it was protocol for typically set at the beginning of large scale photo shoots which I'm sure that they kind of wish that they could push into the side a lot earlier. But now that the photo shoot is going down, got rid of them. <laughs> so the first setup required the ladies to assemble kind of near a chaise and a chair, like a low lounge in a chair. While Longoria lounged on the chaise, Huffman was leaned against it at the far left, and Nicolette Sheridan took the far right, which also Hatcher, and then Marcia Cross. And so, cool, they're getting a pose. But then... <laughs> Marsha Cross saw Terry Hatcher was beside her in an iPod, bright red suit, directly middle shot. So Marsha Cross grabbed her bathrobe and exploded off set, just stormed off. Hatcher just stood there later on, <laughs> which is very untypical for an LA day because right now it's actually like 90 degrees and not a single cloud in the sky. And I'm wearing a JC Couture tracksuit. Very committed to video. Eva Longoria wears so many JC Couture tracksuits in this. Also, it's really comfy. Later with that, their clouds are causing a temporary delay, of course. Even the weather was working against them at this point. Hatcher walked to the other end of the pool where she got into a tearful, heated conversation on her cell phone. In here, that says you were you are actually brought to tears that day. Is there any truth to that? I don't remember tears. After very much switching and compromising, the photographer suggested that Cross and Sheridan switch positions. I think all this is super confusing if you can't, like, if you weren't there which I very much wish that I was. 
Lou suggested that they switch positions, Marsha Cross and Nicolette Sheridan. But Marsha Cross says no. But it just seems like Felicity Huffman, A, was just chilling. Like, she's just vibing. Nicolette Sheridan kind of seems to just be chilling also. And then we do get to hear from the men who are on shoot later, their husbands and boyfriends and teenage lovers, cringe, <laughs> who are on in the photos with them later. So we get to hear their take on it also. So not just, just the ladies. But Marsha Cross didn't want to sit on this chair. She's like, no. She replied, I don't want to sit on a chair. <laughs> Plain and simple. So Terry Hatcher agreed to take the chair, thereby putting Nicolette Sheridan in the middle, which put Marsha Cross beside her and Terry Hatcher on the far right. And at last, everyone was happy and they got their shot. And it's the shot that we ended up with right here, which is awkward when it came out because the magazine was actually folded. So I believe you couldn't even see, I want to say Marsha Cross and Felicity Huffman, and all of that for the fold out then. Couldn't even see two of five. <laughs> they got the shot. And now going on to their individual shots, which all ended up being great single shots with very minimal drama, which was awesome. Four out of five went smoothly. Marsha Cross is having some issues with a fan, and that's not her fault. It's, it's the fan's fault. I mean, the fan is working against them. We got the weather, the swimsuits, and the enabler, everyone. <laughs> so, so the fan was actually blowing too high um, up Marsha Cross's skirt, looking rather risque. And the photo is gorgeous. She's like with these clippers. Um, Cutting off, cutting off a piece of the hedge that is a man <laughs> with her husband to the side. And the purple dress is gorgeous. She looks stunning. The, all the single shots are beautiful. She just stood there while her skirt was blowing up, um, very poker face, while they demanded to stop taking the picture. And one of the publicists actually said, it doesn't say the neighbors, it just says a publicist, and that they are not leaving and that they're going to have to pull this publicist off the set because you can see her underwear. Actually, things got so bad that day. So bad. It was only supposed to be a seven hour shoot. Things went so bad that day that the head of ABC Publicity was called away from his weekend of leisure, well, that weekend of leisure, to come down to set and calm things, like try to just calm everything down. He came to the Bing Crosby house and was just trying to have things go smoothly. So I'm sure he was very much not a handicapper about this at all. Everything finally ended around 7 p.m. So three hours later than schedule. Remember, they're trying to start at 9, Eva Longoria at 7. So she, she's had a 12-hour day. And after a very tiring day, as a gesture of goodwill, someone from the photographer's camp extended an olive branch to neighbor, trying to say, we got some great shots. She told him everything ended up being great, which the shots were gorgeous. They did. But the neighbor stood firm, saying, that's what you think. My actors were miserable all day. And this was actually the last, I believe, the scene cover that they all shot together, like on set together. No one was photoshopped place in. I believe that this was the last magazine cover that they ever shot as a group. So this definitely had a scarring experience for, uh, for eight seasons, for eight years, maybe nine years because of filming. That's wild. If I am wrong about that, I just read that. If I am wrong, please correct me. But that's just crazy to think about. So after all this, April 12th, the fold-out cover, Beds, Burbs, and Beyonds hit the newsstand. And in center position, Volanta and Nicolette Sheridan, who had Archer to the side of her, Marsha Cross with Eva Longoria and Felicity Huffman all posed. Even though it was Marsha Cross and Felicity Huffman can't be seen when the cover is folded. So, a little awkward. All that. But it is a gorgeous cover. Like I said, you can get it on eBay for literally $100. You can fit on it. So let's talk about the Saturday Night Live sketch. Evil and Gory decided to poke some fun at the situation in her infamous Saturday Night Live sketch, where she played her rumored enemy, which I'm sure was awkward when they had to see each other at work on Monday. The cast of the skit is actually pretty iconic. And what really happened at the Vanity Fair photo shoot? And it aired on November 19th, 2005. Mark, the photographer, is played by Bill Hader. Terry Hatcher is played by Eva Longoria. Marsha Cross was played by Amy Poehler. Eva Longoria was played by Rachel Drake. Drake? Well, Heaven was played by Kirsten Wig. And Nicolette Sheridan was played by Seth Meyer, which is a choice in on its own. How this get opened, the voiceover, I'll just play it now. The question all of planet Earth wants answered. What really happened at the Desperate Housewives Vanity Fair photo shoot? But one line that Eva Longoria says 
in this, she delivers this line. I just say I'm so happy to be with you guys and to have my comeback. Oh, no! no! You're in the middle! No! interesting kind of how fast media moves now whereas this would probably just been made maybe a youtube video for like a week or two and then no one would really talk about it but the cover came out in april and this skit came out in november and it was still really relevant talk about some of the male leads and what they had to say about about the photo shoot it's like savant if i love you pronounce the name Sorry, sometimes not the best at pronouncing things. If I pronounce it wrong, just let me know down below. <laughs> Who was Lynette's husband, Tom, insisted that the publication actually set up the whole thing in the most contentious way. <laughs> he said, telling Entertainment Weekly, and I quote, I was at the shoot. I got done with my hair and makeup, and I was like, I'm going to grab something to eat. And I was walking around to a makeshift table when a production assistant stopped me and said, what are you doing? You got to go to hair and makeup. And I started taking me there, and I was like... <laughs> I love this because I can just picture like if you watch a show and you know Tom and like I guess like the character of Tom and the actor plays him it's just so easy to picture him saying this hey buddy <laughs> I know it might not look like much but I'm done can I get something to eat now he says that there was a lot of tension and it was one of the most inhospitable environments he's ever been in for a photo shoot Denton who is spoiler is Susan husband <laughs> he's the plumber at the time is that there's no disputing the vanity fair story happened but it happened because these women were given a golden opportunity and they all know they better make the most of it because hollywood's very tough on women and it's just people going oh my god this is a huge hit i better take advantage of it every day or i don't want it to be terry's show because i need a job after this that caused a lot of conflict understandably even Lagoria is quoted saying, put it all down to being tired. <laughs> she said, we did so much press. We were all so exhausted. By this time, the Vanity Fair thing came around at the end of shooting the first year. We were all so run down. Well, what did Marsha Cross have to think about this? Well, she was just more upset that people thought for a long time that she was the bitch because her character was so high strung. So she just played her character so well and so believable that people actually just kind of believe that that's just who she was in real life. No one else could play Brie besides Marsha Cross. Like, Brie is personally my favorite character, my favorite housewife. But let me know who's your favorite housewife. Story was even verified by Terry Atcher. At this point, she said in an Access Hollywood interview, she claimed that the group was instigated by an ABC representative. ABC and the Desperate Housewives cast, this was quoted by, I guess, the Access Hollywood interview. ABC and the Desperate Housewives cast probably thought they got away with the onset catfight until the issue came out that divulged literally everything that went down, including the cover line you won't believe what it took just to get this photo. Considering that Vanity Fair does have a track record, track record of turning interviews into celebrity and tell all. I'm surprised that the Desperate Housewives cast didn't play nice in front of the reporters to not taint the brand new series that since it meant so much. So, I guess all in all, just kind of found it absolutely fascinating. Um, just everything that went down just to get this one cover. For the rest of the eight seasons, they didn't really do another photo shoot magazine cover with all of them together. But there is definitely something to say kind of about Hollywood and, of course, how the industry loves pitting women against each other. Really scary to have such a hit show or come from something big, like especially Superman or such esteemed like roles. So I'm sure they felt the even more added pressure, even though they all were gorgeous and incredibly talented. It's just really interesting looking back 16 years ago, this magazine cover kind of rocked all of 2005. Just how quickly entertainment turns around. We've been talking forever. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it if you made it this far. You all have a wonderful rest of your day or rest of your week or whenever you're watching this. And yeah, thank you for hanging out and see you next time. Bye!